So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 138, which is a really incredible group chat that we just had with Fabrice Grenda, who's a founding partner at FJ Labs. So Fabrice is someone that, of course, we all know in the world of marketplaces and has some really incredible operator experience previously and now investing at FJ Labs. They've backed over a thousand companies, including notable marketplaces like Alibaba, Coupang, Flexport, Rappi, and more. So this is a really great chat with Fabrice where we got to learn more about his previous operator experience. Now at FJ Labs investing in marketplaces, got to learn more about it as a venture fund, discuss what they look for in marketplaces that they invest in, the current fundraising environment, opportunities for marketplaces, and also had a really great group Q&A. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I felt like it was a masterclass kind of packed into one group chat, and I know you're going to find it a great watch to the end. So Fabrice, welcome to the uh, group chat. You know, it's a real treat to have you uh, join us here today. So I'd like to start off by saying, you know, huge thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, do so in advance. You know, so I'm looking forward to diving into all of your awesome uh, marketplace operator experience and, uh, you know, now investing in them at uh, FJ Labs. But I think before we do, though, I think it might be great if you can uh, start off by sharing a little bit more on your background, though, for those that uh, don't know you. And then uh, what led you to the uh, world of marketplace startups? Sure. Worked for McKinsey and Company for a few years in New York. Uh, 98, right time, right place, right skills. And by the way, I got to McKinsey knowing I want to be a tech founder is just, this is cool, except they pay you. I uh, decided uh, to go start building tech companies. The problem is... I, you know, I was 23, didn't, and most of the ideas out there required a level of capital or skill that I didn't have, right? If you want to build Amazon, you need billions of dollars in supply chain and inventory management. If you want to build E-Trade, you need like banking licenses, et cetera. And I was looking for ideas I could bring to the world and uh, kind of randomly one day fell on the eBay website and it was like love at first click. And obviously marketplaces have a very unique problem of the chicken neck problem of uh, you get supply or demand and how do you match them, et cetera. But it was one that was uniquely positioned to address because I'd actually studied uh, market design in college and I it made so much sense like bring liquidity to opaque markets and um, that was it. Uh, I started by building an eBay type company in Europe uh, and Latin America, uh, sold that to publicly traded competitor. Then did a brief foray and from 01 to 05 in mobile content and selling ringtones, not because I particularly liked it, but because I needed a company in the post bubble bursting world uh, that would, could be profitable quickly and required very little capital. I grew that from zero to 200 million revenues in four years, profitable, sold it to another publicly traded competitor. And then in um, 06, went on to build OLX, which today is the largest classified site in the world with. Uh, over 10,000 employees in 30 countries, leading uh, classified player, but obviously classified is done right. So imagine Craigslist with a modern UX UI, free moderate content, integrated payments and shipping. And uh, we're the leading player in Brazil and all of LATAM, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Romania, all of Eastern Europe, UAE and all of the Middle East, and India, Pakistan, all of Southeast Asia. And I sold that to. Uh, another publicly treated company um, called NASFERS, or today called Process, in 2013. And um, while I was doing all these things, uh, I was being approached by other founders to help them and invest in their companies. So I started angel investing back in 98 and uh, took on life of its own by 2013 at uh, over 170 investments, mostly marketplaces, and uh, dozens of exits was doing really well. And so that ultimately led to uh, partnering with my partner Jose and building FJ Labs, which today, of course, has over a thousand investments, of which probably 700 or more or marketplaces. I mean, that's a pretty incredible uh, background. And, you know, thanks for sharing with us. So we're going to jump into, uh, you know, there with that. But but I guess kind of, you know, going back to uh, to OLX, though, you know, could you maybe walk us through like some of the pivotal points of it as, as a business and, you know, maybe some of the kind of key learnings from the operational side that you've now taken with you to uh, to investing? So I first tried to buy Craigslist and or convince Craig to let me run Craigslist. I told him, I told him to do it for free. Let me, let me, uh, you know, revamp the UXUI, pre-moderate the content. Of course, you need to hire a thousand people to do that, which I was more than happy to. But he uh, turned me down uh, both times I offered, both in 2005 and in 2013, post-selling OLX. Um, and I'm like, you know what? Let's go build a better mousetrap. And because the VCs who try to back me and my prior company 
of course, they didn't want, they didn't back me when we were money losing. They came to me in 04 when we were already profitable and they're like, Hey, we have all this money for you. I'm like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I don't need you anymore. Uh, I was like, I lived in New York and $2 a day for two years, like eating ramen. That's when I needed you. <laughs> um, so they had FOMO. And because they had FOMO, they're like, okay, here's 10 million on a PowerPoint, basically, uh, at a 20 million valuation pre launch, uh, which gave me the capital to basically throw a lot of spaghetti in the wall. And, and so I'm like, okay, I wanted the strategy I designed was let's start C to C, uh, mo focusing on for sale goods because there's way more recurrence than if you go to cars and real estate and then ultimately go to the other categories. And, Lutz launch. We spent 50k in a hundred countries, so really throwing spaghetti on the wall, uh, which is five million dollars. And it just so happened it really, really took off in Pakistan and Portugal, and it took off in India and Brazil. Of course, from a value creation perspective, in uh, Brazil and India were uh, more relevant. So focus on these four countries. We went from 100 countries to four, grew it, became very big, and then used the profits to go to the other countries, and then eventually went to the 30 countries. Now. So many lessons learned because we really didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, I I didn't realize the power of SEO. You know, I I like notionally knew SEO. Oh yeah, let's get indexed in Google. People type our name, we show up. Um, most of our early demand side acquisition was SEM. We were doing long tail SEM because the the eBay's of the world would buy like used car. And no one was bidding on BMW X3, 20,000 mile red, whatever, New York. I mean, obviously, we didn't do it in the US because uh, it was too expensive. But we were paying like a, a penny at CPC. We're getting massive traffic for essentially free. And it was working well, but we were not getting a lot of organic traffic. And then we, to build liquidity, bought 13 sites. And so one of the good ones we bought, 100% of the traffic is organic. And then we realized, oh, wait a minute, every single add could be indexed um and we could get a huge amount of, of free organic traffic so we had to re-engineer the entire site uh for seo and and basically build a better seo mousetrap we got the first 100 million unique visitors essentially purely through seo uh so eventually you transcend that you have to build a brand etc cetera, etc cetera. but like it, it, it was like uh a, a key pivotal moment we didn't even know we that, that that was relevant the other big one is because of our US centric view, we obviously do Craigslist, uh, completely unaware of a European publicly traded competitor based in Norway called Shipstead that also happened to run most of the leading classified sites in Western Europe. Um, obviously, we didn't break out in any Western European countries because there was an incumbent and with powerful network effects. Uh, but I, it never occurred to me that they would be tempted to come after us in our core markets. And sadly, they JV'd with uh, another company called Telenor, and they spent 300 million in TV in Brazil, 50 million TV in Portugal, attacking us, which led to an all out war uh, where I did dilute myself essentially to zero, led me to sell. I didn't want to sell the company in order to have uh, the firepower to fight back. And eventually we won the war, but it was a expensive, powerful war of attrition. No, it uh, certainly sounds like it. So, and that's also a really interesting point you uh, you mentioned as far as like the power of SEO. So that's uh, that's something we uh, we discuss in the community quite a bit. So, you know, so transitioning over to uh, to the uh, to the investing side, because I know I know we could dive into your operational experience for uh, for probably a whole chat here. But you know, most of us uh, know of uh, FJ Labs as a uh, you know leading uh, marketplace kind of focused uh, venture fund. But could you maybe give us like a an overview of it today? Sure. I guess we we behave like angel investors because it came out of my angel investing activities, and so. I say FJ Labs is like uh, angel investing at venture scale. We take two one-hour meetings over the course of a week. Uh, and on those two one-hour meetings, we decide if we invest or not. We tell you why yes or why no. We basically evaluate four things. Do we like the team? You know, do, do are you an amazing visionary salesperson who can execute? Do we like the business? And we care deeply about union economics. We're mostly C to A, so mostly post-launch, but... Even pre-launch, we expect you to be able to articulate what your unit economics are going to be based on landing page analysis, understanding the market, et cetera. Number three, do we like the deal terms? Nothing's cheap at tech, but is it fair in light of the size of the opportunity, the traction, et cetera? And number four, is it in line with our thesis of the future of the world and is it making the world a better place? And we have 
a clear thesis on that future work, future food, future real estate, et cetera. Um, and we need all four to be collectively true for us to invest. We invest in two to 300 deals a year. We write reasonably small checks, 300 to 400K. Um, well, maybe 100K to 500K, maybe probably, but the average is like two to 300. We don't lead, we don't price, we don't take board seats. We're just your friendly, value-added investors, and we have a key superpower is we help you fundraise. You need a lead, we'll help you find a lead. You need you need a lead for your next round, we will intro you to Sequoia, Greylock, Brainshark, and Dreesen. We will get you funded. Um, this was honestly nearly as valuable in 2021, but today everyone seems to value that dramatically. Yeah, certainly. I was going to say that's uh, de- definitely a, a big value add to uh, to founders. So, so you mentioned uh, some, you know, like the uh, four kind of criteria. But as far as like when it comes to like the stage, say like a uh, pre seed and kind of seed, um, you know, what are some of the kind of metrics or, or benchmarks that that you're seeing kind of now um, for for marketplaces to kind of raise at those stages? Yeah, so so pre seed is usually pre launch, so no no metrics. It's more uh, you need to be able to convince me that with a million dollar at five pre or whatever that you're raising pre seed you're going to get to where you need to be in the next 18 months to get your seed round. The seed round, uh, very, I'll give you a range in the consumer facing marketplaces with maybe a 15% take rate, one five. Um, your seed round, you're like 150K in GMV um, with a 15% take rate. You're doing, you probably have like 60, 70% gross margin. Um, and you're raising three and nine pre, you know, if you're really crushing it, maybe you're raising at like 12 free, but like that, that's kind of the range. And the expectation is with that, you get your series A, which is be like 750, 500K to million in GMV, uh, same take rate, good economics, good economics, meaning you recoup your fully loaded CAC after six months, you kind of three extra CAC after 18 months on a net contribution margin basis on CM2 basis. And because of negative churn, you don't know what your LTV to CAC is. You haven't been around that long, uh, but you're hoping that it looks like it's 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, whatever. Regardless of the acquisition channel, by the way, it doesn't matter to me if it's paid, if it's free, if it's sales team. Um, if you're in a B2B marketplace, then the GMV is typically, the take rate is usually somewhat lower, the GMV is somewhat higher. So your seed might be, if you're taking like whatever, 5%, maybe your seed is 500K a month in GMV. Um, taking 5% and your, um, and maybe it takes a bit longer to recoup your CAC, but we expect that the LTV is higher because you have retention. So we're going to look very deeply on, on retention. Gives you a sense of like the, 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 the metrics we're seeing right now. These are median numbers, by the way. Um, if you're a second time founder and you've crushed it the first time, you're going to get a much better term. So the mean is higher than the median. Uh, because there are deals that are like one or two cent deviations to the right of the mean that are move that move it um, dramatically up. But these are median tra- deals right now, which are back to, I'd say, 2018, 2017, 2019 numbers. Uh, and the C and A's have really reset um, quicker than the very late stage, actually. Yeah, that's a that's a really great uh, breakdown for us. I know it's going to lead to quite a few questions here when we get to them, but uh, really helpful to kind of uh, I th- I think also kind of differentiate between you know consumer and and B two B. So we have quite a few B two B marketplace founders, and they seem to be becoming uh, you know more popular. Um, so on, on that note too, are you seeing any kind of like specific kind of trends with marketplaces right now? For sure, B two B marketplaces is where bread and butter. The vast majority of marketplaces we're investing are B two B. And the reason is easy. In like the consumer world, you have these extraordinary user experiences. You have Uber, you have Airbnb, you have Amazon, you want so you have DoorDash, you want something, you get it in like 15 minutes or the next day. And and penetration is ready 15, 20, 25 percent in many core categories. And and you look at most industries, and there's nothing. I mean, uh, uh, we're sub one percent penetration and most we're sub five percent and in the worst case in, in every industry and these are like trillion dollar industries petrochemicals steel you know even sourcing gravel for your construction site uh labor for each of these marketplaces and so the for each category you need to create an uh, an online catalog with availability you need to be connecting the erps of the manufacturers so you actually have manufacturing capacity all the way to the back ends you need to be able to track like tracking payments insurance uh, and all of these may be very different companies and so for every single vertical 
you may have like five or 10 companies attacking the vertical in different ways to, to solve the entire supply chain issue. But if you look at some of our more successful marketplaces the last few years, it's things like Flexport, uh, the uh, digital freight forwarder, ShipBop, the last mile logistics company, or Node, which is uh, or Node, which is a petrochemicals marketplace, or uh, rig up, I mean, now called WorkRise, which is a labor marketplace for oil services workers, or Trusted Health for nurses, and Rebus for Seal, ProV, B2B distribution for alcohol. I mean, and the list goes on. And, and so it's really the bread and butter. So that's the core core trend, I would say, is B2B marketplaces. The sub trend is how they're designed. The modern marketplace design is one where you do a lot of the work for the supply and the demand side. We're, we're basically in, in an old marketplace model, you know, maybe, maybe it's an RFQ process where you say, I, I, I'm looking for this. You get 50 people to apply. You have to sort through them. And that's kind of like the Upwork model of the labor side. Um, the new model is just say what you need. The market is actually picks your supplier. You know, kind of like Uber, you don't pick your driver. Uber picks. So it's a marketplace pick model. So the marketplace says, look, we know best who is availability, who can give you the best pricing, the payment terms, et cetera. We will do it for you. The, I guess, third trend, which is more related to the first one in terms of like businesses that are being built today is SMB enablement and helping the SMBs compete with the large chains. So, you know, if, if you're a Luigi and you, you, oh, you created your pizzeria, it's not because you love the idea of I'm going to do accounting and negotiate with Uber and, and I'm going to go and answer comments and Google on Google and Yelp and TripAdvisor and negotiate with suppliers. And no, you like cooking pizza and hanging out with your customers, right? <laughs> if you created, if you're a barista, if you created a coffee shop, you like serving coffee and, and having the social scene there. Like everything else you don't like. And so when you're ambassadors and companies like Odeco, which is helping mom and pop coffee shops compete with Starbucks by giving them better supply. The NPS is super high because they have the keys to the store. They replenish the inventory at night. Or Slice, which is helping the pizzerias compete with uh, Domino's or, or Fresha, which is helping the barbershops compete with, with Supercuts. All of different business models based on the different unique circumstances in, in each vertical. But the general thing is we help you do the things you love to do and we take care of everything else. And so it kind of falls both in a future work perspective uh, and media. Now, there's some uh, really great examples. So uh, Alir from Slice is actually a previous group chat guest, and uh, that was that was such a such a great chat. So, um, yeah. so, so you know, one thing I did uh, did did want to kind of bring up is you know uh, I think like with so, some of the B2B marketplaces where they often kind of start off you know looking more like kind of like brokerage uh, models um, in the very early days. You know, how do you think about that? You know, when you're kind of evaluating them and they they might be so early. So I don't want you to be a distributor for, uh, for someone else because then you have no pricing power. So the the way to evaluate that is looking at, at actually concentration. And, and it's not concentration uh, at the national level. It might be concentration at the at local level. So for instance, we're investors in a gravel marketplace in Germany called Schutflix. And they're doing, um, and, and it's a three-sided marketplace between the queries, the trucks, the trucking people that are delivering the, the gravel to the construction sites and the construction sites. Um, and there it's fragmented uh, at every level and it works well. In the US, a bunch of P companies rolled up queries. And so even though there are a lot of queries and none of them have large market share in the US, you're not delivering gravel from California to New York. And so when you start, we started looking at the dynamics, they, there was so much concentration at every one geo that basically was a duopoly or a monopoly that didn't make sense to build a marketplace because you had no pricing power. And so you're not going to be able to extract a rake. So con concentration of your supply and demand uh, matters dramatically. Obviously, the more fragmentation you want. But the thing is, on if you look at it from afar at a national level, it looks it actually looks fragmented. The thing is, the nuance is you're sourcing locally and at a local level, it's not fragmented at all. And so we don't want you to be a, a broker and the way you can address that is usually see, or you, so you may do very little other than like put in and touch the buyer and the seller, and that's fine. In the long run, you probably want to do a lot more than that, but, uh, but you really want fragmentation.
that's another uh, great example. So you, you bring up uh, so many cool marketplaces. I, I I know you see quite a bit. Um, I guess on that note too, it might be uh, helpful to you know to share a little bit more about uh, the kind of geographies that you that you look at or invest in. Or I guess it's easy. We invest in all geographies. Uh, <laughs> the but we are our bread and butter is U.S. Canada. It's fifty five percent what we do. We're twenty five percent Western Europe and the Nordics. Ten percent Brazil, India, and ten percent rest of the world. And by rest of the world, I mean. Nigeria, Namibia, Algeria, Chile, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, I mean, you name it. Uh, we really do everywhere. Um, you're more likely to do an innovative business model in the U.S. and and to do something that's more proven in the rest of the world. Um, but the there are businesses that are like more attractive in emerging markets, for instance, than, than the U.S. So we're investors in a B2B FMCG marketplace. For, so helping bodegas source the inventory that they sell to consumers and helping them manage the, manage their inventory and improve pricing um where they have so many suppliers they, they don't necessarily know the best terms and if they have to buy very complex uh, shopping baskets so there's a company called alerzo nigeria you the, the little bodega you create your entire shopping market and then the the marketplace auto picks the very best supplier for you based on your entire basket, based on payment terms, pricing, et cetera. And it makes sense in Nigeria because 95% of groceries in Nigeria are sold in mom and pops. France would be the counter example where uh, Carrefour and Casino, uh, so the, if you want Walmart and Trader Joe's equivalent of, um, of France would have such a large percentage of grocery distribution that that idea doesn't make sense there. Uh, and so we are global. That said, bread and butter is U.S. and Canada. Are there any, uh, you know, kind of uh, common misconceptions maybe with uh, founders, you know, at their earlier stages that, that might be helpful to share with us here? Yes. The biggest mistake all founders make is they get too much supply. <laughs> They're like, we're going to we're going to get like infinite supply in the marketplace. It'll show we can get listings. It's attractive. And this will be a proof point for VCs. They'll invest, et cetera. The problem if you do that is you're not going to match your supply and demand. The supply is not going to see any demand and therefore they're going to churn and they're not going to be engaged. So let's say I wanted to build a locksmith marketplace in New York City. I can probably call every single locksmith in New York over the course of a month and and tell them, hey, we don't charge anything. We just say commission. If I find you a customer, I'll take 10%. Would you want to be in the marketplace? They're all going to say yes, right? Like the supply is fin financially motivated to be in the marketplace. So I can very easily have a marketplace with literally 100% of the supply in New York. Um, but then, of course, I don't have any demand. They, I'm not going to send any customers. By the time I send one to someone, they probably don't even remember we exist. They're not going to be engaged. They're not going to reply. It's not going to be the best occurrence. So I would typically start. Most marketplaces are demand constrained, not supply constrained. Uh, because, as I said, the supply side is financially motivated in the marketplace. So... Get the supply, but get the very best supply, highly curated in your region. And it may region, maybe the entire country. It depends, I mean, on the category you're in. And bring them demands. Make sure they're happy. Give them a high NPS. Uh, bring them love. And it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter to me if it's sales team, if uh, if uh, uh, if you bought, bought ads or whatever. And once you have a fill rate that's reasonably high, so you have liquidity... So in a used good marketplace, if the probability of the used goods selling is above 20%, you have liquidity. In a services marketplace or labor marketplace, you want to represent at least 20% of the income of the supply, of each individual supply, not the not the average or not the best. Like, And um, once you're there, you have liquidity. And once you have that, you can start scaling, adding more supply, keeping the two really in, in, in sync. Yeah, what you don't want is a very low fill rate with infinite supply, which is probably the single biggest mistake that I see um, marketplace founders make. Yeah, I'll have to admit I uh, definitely made that mistake in the uh, in the past myself. So I, I wish I would have heard this a few years ago when I was building a marketplace. So, so we're gonna get into group questions here in a bit. Otherwise, you and I could probably just go on on uh, you know talking about different topics here. Um, but uh, you know, right before we do, so do you maybe have like you know a, a few tips that you could share um, for early stage founders right now that are that are fundraising? Yeah, if you're fundraising, I would say have a beautiful deck, you know, 15, 20 pages. That is uh, that is a very clear strategy. Uh, reach out to 
mistakes people make fundraising at large. Like they contact every VC in the world, not understanding who's investing at what stage and what categories they're interested in, right? Like if you're sending me a series D biotech company, yeah, not for me. Uh, and, and, and so have a beautiful deck, send the deck. Don't be afraid of it. Don't ask for NDAs and all that thing that no one ever signs. Uh, j just pre show that you're professional and you know how the game is played. Try to get a warm intro. Uh, I'd be surprised if you don't know people who know any, every VC, if someone at any, every major VC, um, in, in, in the U S but if not, um, you can probably still do a cold email as long as you have all the information because it should never be, Hey, I have a great startup, uh, or you interested in learning more, send me a deck. Like we are, we're getting 300 pitches a week. I need to be able to decide whether it's not, it's worth considering taking a call in like 30 seconds. We will look at cold and bound deals. Most of which are coming through my LinkedIn. That said better through warm intro if possible. Um, VCs, I would contact for early stage marketplace investing NFX, uh, would be reasonably top of the list. I'd say first round capital slow, um, Jackson Square Ventures. Um, if you're a pre seed, there's not many like a four amplify, uh, pre seed are often more done as like club angel deals than that. There are not that many pre seed funds other than like in Blue four. Um, obviously us at the seed level, we're more seed level investors. We will do pre seed occasionally, but I mean, you, it needs to transcend because the reason we don't do pre-seed is usually we end up seeing like seven companies doing the exact same thing at pre-seed teams are amazing. And it's, we don't invest in competitors. I mean, we'll, we'll do two different companies in the same space if they're in different geos and they're not going to each other's geos. But if there's seven people going the after the same category in the U S we're making one bet. And if we make the bet and we're wrong, we just basically shut ourselves out of the entire category. So we're going to wait until we have enough information that we feel like okay, we're backing the winner, uh, which is why it's more seed and A for us than it is pre-seed. Um, but anyway, going back to the basics, yeah, try to get worm intros, contact the guys that are focusing marketplaces at the right stage for you, and give them enough information to make it compelling. Also, don't write like, you know, 27 paragraph email, right? Like literally, this is who, this is my credentials. This is what we're doing. These are like the key metrics like GMV, takery, whatever great economics, here's the deck, you know, uh, this is how much we're raising, is that up your alley? And obviously all these things need to be reasonable. You're raising a seed round, you're raising two to three. Uh, you can't be raising 15, otherwise in today's world, no one's going to even take you seriously. I know this is going to be uh, super helpful for uh, for founders here. So, uh, hey, hey uh, John, do you want to come on? We'll just go ahead and uh, jump right into questions. Yeah. Hey, Fabrice. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm actually a founder of an FJ portfolio company called Leland. So uh, I've, I've worked more with with Jose and Luke than, than yourself. And it's great to meet you. Um, I was going to ask about AI, but I actually want to follow up with something that you had just mentioned in your, your previous comment, which is around uh, being 20% of a supplier's business. And I think one of the, one of the, the common, I guess, maybe misconceptions or, or maybe thoughts around building product for marketplaces is that if we build the best tooling so the supply will bring all of their business to us versus focusing on the customer and driving demand for them and i'm curious do you, have you seen instances where that argument plays out and and supply does actually effectively bring their entire business over to the over to uh the marketplace or do you feel like in 99% of the cases, it tends to be just drive demand and supply will kind of, they'll, they'll move over as you bring them demand. It's usually the latter, but the, the answer is usual in, in life is it depends. Um, yeah. so if you look at the creator economy marketplaces, you have the ones like, uh, cameo where the marketplace brings the demands. Uh, but you have the ones like OnlyFans or ChatPay, et cetera, where there's not even a search engine. Like literally, it's the influencer that is bringing their own their own demand side, uh, and and the marketplace is purely the tools that is allowing the community to be monetized. So uh, it 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 really depends on like the unique circumstances. Uh, but in most marketplaces, I would say you're giving them tools that make their lives easier. Um, they start ordering, you know, maybe. 
so right now, uh, uh, I guess another big trend we could have mentioned before we're investors now in a lot of B2B marketplaces from India exporting to the US um, in every major vertical, ceramics, uh, linen. So basically offshoring out of India, of China into India to export to the US. And they are becoming one supplier to whatever a, a demand side customer in, in Europe or the US. Uh, and as they're faster turnaround, better pricing, higher quality, little by little, they're gaining share. And, and so it's just gaining share. Uh, um, and, and so negative revenue churn, I guess, is what we're looking for. Uh, but it's not as though uh, people were coming all the way uh, um, all the way through. So the line that Tim wrote, come for the tools, save for the network, uh, I think is, uh, it, it, it is very accurate. Cool. Thanks for Bruce. That's a great question. We'll have to uh, circle back on the uh, AI question because I know uh, quite a, quite a few people had that. So um, we're going to call in. Uh, hey Max, did you uh, want to come on? Thanks a lot, Fabrice, for for the great insights. I'm Max, uh, founder of SourceForce. Um, we are we are developing a B two B marketplace for commodity chemicals. Um, currently backed by Bowery. Uh, super um, super interesting to see your take on liquidity building. So I see a lot of mistakes being made about going to, you know, far too wide from a skew perspective. Yep. And then when you look at B2B, it's like there's actually a really focused either maximum bundle that people buy. What do you think about the strategy of just focusing on like, the extreme end, just one product, getting the liquidity going there and then expanding out from there? And how have other successful founders found that product? Yeah, well, look, it depends on, it depends on buyer behavior, right? Like if the buyer will buy just that one product they need it and they don't buy bundle with other things yeah just do that one product it's easiest so the um, i'm chairman and co-founder of a handbag marketplace called rebag when they started they were trying to be um uh, like the real real like we do all luxury items and i'm like no 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 you're adding so much complexity because with dresses you have sizes and return issues and like and by the way the aov is too low to make the economics work if you're doing consignment uh, let's just do handbags, two thousand dollars, just luxury handbags, two thousand dollar AOV, nothing else, and, and it simplifies your operations, decreases returns, lower costs, it's better. And and so on the B two B side, I would look at if the buyer is willing to buy just one SKU or definitely one vertical type. So for instance, we just invested in a company that's doing um, uh, contract manufacturing. And they had to think through in India for US, actually, no, for Indian customers in this case. And they had to think through what are we doing? And they're doing like, um, they're doing only consumer electronics. Uh, but manufacturers, manufacturers, they could have done a billion of other categories, but like having a network in the supply and the demand side, understanding better what people are looking for, getting better at the quality control, et cetera, but like makes all the difference. So yeah, go vertical, go narrow, broaden later. Uh, you can, the, A, these things end up being bigger than you think they are to begin with. And number two, uh, once you have liquidity in a category, meet one side, will probably want more things, the band or supply, or can make more things on the supply side, and then you can expand. But yeah, I, I like that as a strategy. Go narrow to go broad later. Thanks a lot. Awesome. That was a great question. Hey, Fabrice, I'm just going to jump on here with the uh, question because I had quite a few uh, uh, post or add it to the uh, Google Doc in advance and then uh, send me a message here. Um, but, you know, uh, AI, of course, is, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the, the topic of, uh, of of the moment right now, right? And so um, how have you seen uh, maybe some uh, some great examples of marketplaces maybe that have kind of leveraged it, um, you know, the way that's from like listing creation, matching, or, or et cetera? Every company is an AI company, right? Like, so we don't invest in AI people that are building LLMs. Uh, that are undifferentiated and undifferentiated data sets. Uh, but every company we are investing in is using AI in some ways you important. Now, every company is using it mostly to improve productivity, uh, lower cost and customer service, and improve productivity of the programmers. And and that's definitely true. I use it myself for coding help when, I, when I'm when i coding things, and I'm not as good a coder as I used to be. Um, and it works extraordinarily well. Now, Examples of how to use it in marketplaces effectively. Well, actually, going back to Rebag, um, Rebag is built an AI called Claire. With um, Claire is their handbag authentication uh, AI. So imagine you're trying to sell on eBay. Take your phone, you take 10, 10 pictures, you log into your account, you upload the pictures, you have to write a title, you write a description, you pick a price, you select a category. It's a long, arduous process. 
On Rebag, you take one photo of the handbag. The AI says, this is the model. And by the way, I, you show me the handbag for 2020, 21, 22. I mean, obviously not target demographic here. They look identical to me or a fake one and a real one. They look identical to me. And the AI will be like, okay, this is the 2020 model, submodel this, authentic. Based on the photos you sent, this is the condition. This is the price. This is the title. This is the category. Literally one photo. Okay, it's more than one photo, but a couple photos, boom, done. I mean, it's incredible, and it, it increases the the listing rate dramatically. Um, and, and because it makes you pick the right price, et cetera, it increases the success rate and the sell-through rate dramatically as well. Um, another example is in a, a company called Photo Room. Photo Room is a tool that most, uh, m- most companies uh, selling products should be using, especially on the consumer side where you tell the AI what you're selling on which site, and it will basically pick auto pick the right background for you. So sometimes it just removes the background and makes it creates a white background and makes your product look more beautiful. But sometimes it should be in nature, surrounded by trees, whatever. It'll like literally create the perfect background. Um, and so I, I'm in, interested in applied AI. How are you using AI to increase your sell-through rate, your listing rate, et cetera? But the way to do the, the best way in marketplaces, I would say, is yeah, your AI do auto lists on behalf of the of the supply side. And on the demand side, it depends on the purchase behavior. Uh you have three types of purchase behavior. Uh one purchase behavior is you know what you're looking for, you search for it. Uh, in which case you don't really need AI, as long as you have like your good taxonomy. And good, uh, good category, get good categorization. Uh, there are people that just browse, right? So on the classified side, people are just going through, and they they actually like the process of like shopping. But then there's considered purchases. You don't really, you know, generally when you're, you know, you're looking for a new pair of skis, uh, and so you go to curate it to have a conversation with an expert. I could see AI being extraordinarily useful there, uh, or for travel, F O R A. Which is a you're they're using a your friends as a recommendation travel agents. Uh, I can see AI. So for considered purchases, you know, like you're buying a car, uh, I can see it being m- way more useful there in terms of having like a, an intelligent conversation on, on the side. But for sure, I'd use it on the supply side if you can. Easier to do in a vertical environment than a than a horizontal environment. Like. Rebag is the Kelly Blue Book of uh, handbags. They have all the data they need, and so they can make their AI work extraordinarily well. eBay, for instance, could not do what I just said because it's very different to be selling a trading card than selling a car than selling ev- everything, every other item. You'd miss many of the specs, and so eBay can do it. But if you're vertical, uh, you can probably do it. Those are some uh, really great examples, and uh, also, you know, good point as far as uh, you know for verticals. Uh, yeah, I, re- I wrote a blog post on uh, um, AI, the tools we use, the companies, my my perspective, et cetera. Let me share it in the chat. Um, just called timing is everything, and I and I give specific examples of things we invested in, things we would not invest in. Uh, all the people that are investing, you know, whatever, hundred million and three hundred pre uh, and pre launch companies and AI, we, that is not what we do. Uh, <laughs> um, and there are ideas for tools we use. So we're going to try to squeeze in uh, one last question. I know, uh, Anne, you added a question to the uh, Google Doc in advance. Uh, do, do you want to come on? Hi, Fabrice. I'm Anne. Nice to meet you. I'm the founder of Inseam, and we are a private m- marketplace that connects luxury designer brands with the high value clients that drive the majority of luxury fashion sales by creating a vetted network of personal shoppers and personal stylists that own those relationships. And my question was around cohort data. What metrics or signals do you look for uh, in advance of Series A to indicate that we are gaining significant traction and and becoming the leader? pulling ahead in the group. Yeah, so the core core data and significant traction and pulling ahead are two different things for me, but the, on the core data, yeah, I'd, I'd look at retention, I'd look at recurrence of the purchases, and I'd look to see that the cohorts you have having or improving over time, meaning the new cohorts 
are buying more faster, more often than the older cohorts. And it's not always the case. There are many times where actually you you first get the very best customers for you, and then you realize that that set ends up being reasonably small, and then the second tier customer is actually your worst. And so that's actually bad signaling. Good signaling is when uh, you have negative revenue churn, you have very high customer retention after X months, and they don't need to buy every month, right? Like, but um, if they're buying a few times a year and you have very good, a good evidence for that, that's fantastic. So at the Series A level, I would look for very good unit economics, right? Like having a, I'm sure that your customer acquisition cost is reasonably high in light of the fact that these are uh, wealthy individuals and and your cost structure for maintaining the relationship centers are probably also reasonably high. So are the economics working? Now, do you have the right level of traction and how do you compare it to competitors? I mean, to me, that's more, yeah, what's your GMB, how quickly you're growing, uh, et cetera. But those are two separate categories. Now, I definitely look at core analysis um, uh, I, when, I, when I look at how attractive a business really is. Awesome. Thanks. So we are almost out of time here, Fabrice, but uh, wow, this is, uh, I feel like we just condensed like a masterclass in a marketplace is into, you know, 45 minutes. So we really appreciate, you know, taking the time to uh, join us here today and, uh, you know, answering some of the questions that we had as founders. Um, you know, I did actually have one last question for you myself before you wrap things up though. And that's, you know, if you could uh, go to right back before, maybe before you started uh, OLX or, you know, entered the world of uh, marketplaces, you know, what would you uh, tell yourself about them specifically? Not sure I would tell myself anything different than where I ended up meeting. I think they're amazing. Or yeah, right. You're like bringing liquidity and, and, and opaque markets. You create massive value. Uh, and they are capital efficient. They're winner takes most and often winner takes all. And so there's nowhere else I would want to be building companies and or, and, or investing companies uh, uh, if I, a, a, even if I started from scratch. So now I wish I'd known all the things I didn't know. Uh, but uh, you know, this is part of the process of learning. This is why you guys are on uh, calls like this, where hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to make your own. Certainly. No, I mean, this has been uh, incredibly helpful. So we once again, really appreciate it. And then uh, last but not least, time for a quick plug. So where can we uh, keep up with you at? Uh, read my blog, uh, fabricegrinda.com. I write about everything and anything, sometimes workplaces, sometimes not. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me, uh, just it's Fabrice at fjlabs.com. And, uh, you can also, um, I don't contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't, I, my assistant manages it and usually you can figure out which are relevant messages or not, but yeah, just follow me there if you want. Uh, and for fun life stuff, uh, if you want to mostly want to see pictures of my puppy and my son, and you can follow me on Instagram, Fabrice Grinda. Awesome. Well, you have a lot of uh, marketplace founders coming your way. And we once again, really appreciate it. So thanks again, Fabrice. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for the uh, great questions today too.